So three, two, one, and we're good to go. All right, so thank you everyone again for joining this event. I will now pass the floor to you, Mr. Calvin, and we will have quick opening remark, and then we'll jump right into the event. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you are well in the middle of pandemic and a lot of uncertainty. My name is Calvin Cole, and I'm from Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia. So let me begin with a small um, remarks and introduction. And first, let me use this opportunity to thank you, IA, PSS, and SRZ for inviting FVCI as a part of this important dialogue this evening here in Jakarta. So let me give you a little bit introduction who we are, FPCI. FPCI is stand for Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia. We are founded in 2015 by Ambassador Dino Patijalal, our former Deputy Foreign Minister, and also Ambassadors of Indonesia to the United States. This organization aims to developing Indonesian internationalism and also promoting positive nationalism through, throughout all the islands and also projecting this to the world. We are also continuously studying the most pressing foreign policy issues, not all for Indonesia, but also for South Asia and also the regions. We also study middle powers, geoeconomics, even up to Indonesian diaspora. And of course, the humanitarian issues that always hovering around us, refugees as well. Today, we are the largest foreign policy group tree with around 100,000 people in our network. And every year we convene uh, what is called by Indonesian House of Record, the largest foreign policy conference in the world, uh, use the name Indonesian uh, Conference on Indonesian Foreign Policy. Due to the pandemic, we turned it into a virtual event called Global Town Hall. So Global Town Hall is a, a conference of 12 hours around the clock around the world, involving around nine to 10 sessions that representing all the regions in the globe. Yesterday, uh, last year, the foreign minister of Wangi and seven foreign ministers participate, including Australian, South African, Russians to participate to the dialogue. And this year, we will again to convene. I would like to use this opportunity to say a short message to everybody who are watching this, a message that we should see an, a pandemic in a different in a way, looking at this an opportunity to widen and deepen our cooperations between FCI, with ALSA, with IAPSS, CRC, and all other stakeholders in the regions, which never been possible in the normal time. However, today, using the platform of Zoom and other platforms, we can meet and talk with different countries and people in a matter of hours. So let's use this to become more creative, to crafting more another initiative, to tighten our international cooperation, not only in level of states, but also in level of people to people. So with that, I again, thank you for this opportunity to talk with all of you here, and also to have this distinguished speakers to dis discuss a very important issues is very, very pleased for FPCI to be take part in. So I over back, um, uh, so here, I thank you. B, do we have another remarks? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Calvin. We'll have a quick remark from um, ALSA International and then from EAPS, and then we can start our discussion and getting to know the speakers. So maybe from EAPS first. All right, thank you so much. Um... So I'm Justin Patrick, the president of the International Association for Political Science Students, a democratic uh, student government representing uh, political science students and students in related fields around the world. 
So at IAPS, we organize um, a lot of academic and professional uh, development opportunities for, our, for students, as well as represent our students at uh, national and international levels to try to improve uh, student representation and political science um, education. And we're very much happy to, um, to be here and collaborate um, on this um, event on a very important topic. And both as IEPS Global, as well as IEPS uh, Asia in the IEPS Asia and Oceania Student Research Committee. So thank you so much. And I guess we can pass it on to uh, Alsa. There's some from Alsa. I see we have. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm very grateful to be here. My name is Regina Francine and I am the current Vice President of Training, Exchange and Development from Alpha International. It's my pleasure to be here on behalf of ALSA and deliver a short remarks on this wonderful event. Uh, in this opportunity, I would first like to thank all speakers for their time to share their knowledge on a uh, very important issue as has been mentioned by previous um, remarks in regards to refugee in Asia. And I believe that as, an as a student organization, it is really important for us to collaborate, cooperate, and to always seek in discussing important issues such as this one. So my thank will also go to both organizations that ALSA is collaborating with, IAPS and FCDI, as well as for contributing speakers, moderators, and arranging this wonderful event. To all of our um, audience today in the Zoom or in the live, I hope that from this event, you will learn a substantial materials in regards to refugee and it can be um, a great knowledge that you can pass on to your colleagues and it will help you as well in your uh, professional uh, career in the board. And I believe that from me, that will be all. Um, thank you very much, everyone. So thank you everyone for your remark. Now will we, I will pass the floor to Mr. Calvin and we will start our discussion with our panels. Thank you, B. Let's again, let's start and begin the discussion. So let me begin by greeting everybody in the region from Jakarta. I hope you are well. My name is Calvin Ko. I'm a research associate and program development at Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia. Tonight, I am delighted to be your moderator for an important topic discussion, states and refugees, state obligations and status quo of state actions in Asia, hosted by us and also FTCI. Our discussion will be led by a very distinguished panelist coming across, I would say, Indo-Pacific regions. So first, we have Dr. Brian Barbour. So you can maybe raise your hand so everybody can see you. Dr. Brian is a Senior Refugee Protection Advisor at Act for Peace Affiliate of the Andrew and Renata Caldor Center for International Refugee Law at the University of New South Wales, as well the PhD candidate as well. And the second speaker, we have Dr. Mina C. Bansal. Maybe you can hello to the audience. A chair of the IAPS, IAPS, yeah, IAPSS, Asia and Oceania Student Research Committee. And also, we have a speaker, Micro D. Let me, I'm sorry if I pronounce it wrong. So, we have uh, Micro D. Garcio Giasiomo, IAPSS member of Student Research Committee. And last but not least, we have Ibu Sylvia Yazid, doctor, associate professor in the Department of International Relations, University Catholic of Parahyangan in Bandung. So all these speakers will speak in a different perspective from legal to socials and also in other um, spectrum like politics and others, and also the dynamic of international. So everybody, friends, according to UNHCR in 2020, there are 91 million people of concern 
which just includes the refugees, IDP or internal displaced person and stateless people, 91 million around the globe. In the report of 2020 of UNHCR, the High Commissioner, Filippo Grandi, mentioned that COVID-19 is the game changer. Simply to say, the basic health protocols such as social distancing, stay, work, study at home, wearing masks, washing hands, and getting vaccination are challenging to do or even impossible in many places. The agenda of protecting and leveraging the welfare of refugees is often sidelined by COVID-19 miti COVID mitigation ag agenda in many countries. Even for UNHCR staffer, operational to run a lot of programs severely hampered with the travel restriction and border close. As the pandemic has been with us for almost two years and, dis and disturb everything, yet the pandemic has not able to stop conflicts, political differences, turmoil, civil war, and many things that continues adding numbers of refugees, IDPs, and other people of concerns. In Asia Pacific alone, there are in total 9.7 million people of concern, whereas 4 million of them are refugees, 3.5 million are IDPs, 2.2 million are stateless people. And the hotspots in Asia Pacific are from in Afghanistan and also Myanmar. So let's begin with a very simple question to all the panelists. What is the state of refugees handling in Asia and how COVID-19 has become the game changer to the situation? Maybe I would like to start from Brian. Brian, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick, quick note to say that I am not yet a doctor, but thank you very much. Um, I guess I would begin by just saying um, there are a large number of refugees in Asia, both originating from Asia and hosted in Asia. And this has been the case for the past several decades, at least, um, if not further into antiquity. Um, the context in Asia is one where people usually refer to the low number of accessions to the Refugee Convention. Many countries have not signed up to the Refugee Convention. Um, and so in this context, refugees are often marginalized um, and may be under the radar um, and, as a matter of fact, not even well counted. So even the numbers that we are aware of may not be entirely accurate. Um, this status quo is fairly well recognized. So most academics and practitioners um, are aware of that context of many refugees without much law to deal with it. Um, and therefore a very vulnerable situation for them. Um, but if you look more specifically at any particular context in Asia, there's more to the story. Um, first of all, there are a large number of refugees, whether there is law for it or not. That is just a, an empirical fact. They are there. Um, moreover, non-accession to the convention doesn't mean that there's no law. And accession to the convention also doesn't necessarily mean that in practice, things are going to be effective and fair. And so many states in Asia, you will see, have in fact assumed a lot of legal obligations under international human, uh, human rights law or even having hum human rights provisions in their domestic law. Um, and in practice, most states have laws, policies, and practices that can be used to protect refugees. And aside from states, there are a number of other relevant actors. So UNHCR quite often has a large presence with the permission of the state um, and is engaging in protection work. A lot of civil society actors, many local, um, many national, many international, are on the ground delivering refugee protection to refugees. 
And refugees themselves are not a passive participant. They are quite often at the front line, providing protection to themselves and to others and supporting the communities around them. So all of these various actors are engaged. Um, the COVID-19 context has made things more, uh, more local. So borders are closed and even movement within borders is um, restricted. And for those that were already in a vulnerable position, um, the situation may have become more desperate. Um, that said, there are a number of states in this region as well that are um, including refugees in vaccine uh, dissemination, in um, you know, uh, medical support in, in this context, because at, as a matter of practical reality, um, you can't leave certain populations out if you mean to actually address the risks associated with COVID-19. And so states are taking a more pragmatic approach to it and not ignoring a large population that's within their borders. So there are some positive aspects um, to that. There are also a lot of negative aspects. I mean, even aside from COVID-19, there's been a global growth in xenophobia. Um, and so that has had an effect. Um, politics also has been nationalized in a lot of different contexts. And this has made things quite, uh, quite difficult for refugees to access support. Maybe I'll stop there for the moment. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Doctor is a wish for me, you know, prayer for you. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. So I would like to move to our um, Ibu Menasi, please. I, I'm sorry if I uh, pronounce your name is uh, incorrect. Doctor Minasi, am I correct, Ibu? Yes, it's Minasi. Yeah. <laughs> Minasi. Uh, okay, yes, please. Uh, can you please allow me screen sharing? Of course, of course, please. Still disabled. Give us a moment as Justin will make you able to screen share. Is it visible? Yes. Yeah, please. we can see it. Yeah. Please, doctor. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to express my view on refugees. Well, my topic is like refugees in India, as I belong to India, and I guess I can relate to, uh, with this problem if I talk from Indian perspectives. As we are here talking about laws, so for me, it is really crucial to discuss about refugees laws in India. If we talk about, uh, about uh, India, then India is neither a signatory to the 1951 UN Refugees Convention. Like, but still, as we know, like we are all bound by this UN, but still India is not a uh, signatory to the 1951 UN Refugees, but still India is following the UN guidelines. And in India, all uh, foreign nationals, including refugees, uh, asylum seekers, and stateless persons are governed by the provisions contained in the Foreigners Act 1946, the Registration of Foreigners Act 1939, the Passport Act 1920, and the Citizenship Act 1955. Like, as I told earlier, we are in India, we are not following the 1951 UN guidelines, but what we are following is we have a Foreigners Act, Passport Act, uh, and the Citizenship Act. If I talk about the Passport Act that was passed in 1920, like 1920 was a time when India was colonized. India was not a free nation. Uh, it was passed, uh, this 1920 Passport Act was passed when India was a British ruling nation. Uh, in this uh, Passport Act, it is mandatory uh, for anyone entering India through water, land, or air to possess their passport. And also, and according to this act, we can prohibit the entry of the person not possessing the necessary legal documents. So, as per this act, we can see that India allow only the legal person to enter in its territory. Uh, the second is Foreigners Act 1946. It is still uh, not passed by the government, the free government of India. 
according to this act where the nationality of the person is not evident the onus of proving whether a person is a foreigner or not will lie upon that person the act gives the power to the government of india to detain a person until deported back to their country of origin so this act provide a chance to a person uh, to prove his uh, citizenship then the next is this uh, very recent citizenship uh, act that was just passed two years back according to this act uh, like india can facilitate grant of citizenship to migrants belonging to hindu sikh buddhist jain parsi and christian communities from the our neighbor countries namely afghanistan pakistan and bangladesh who have taken shelter in india due to grounds on, of religions or fear of such petitions on or as before 31st December 2014. As uh, this, uh, our very union minister of uh, Ministry of Home Affairs, uh, of, of Home Affairs on 29 December 2011 issued the guidance stating that whosoever comes to country free prescriptions from their home country will be granting a long term visa for one year. So India has opted a new strategy to allow a visa of one year to a person who has come to India in the form of refugee and if suitable India, India can renew its visa for five years also. And if after uh, this granting of long term visa, if uh, India is uh, India want to send that person back to its country, then India can go consult with this UNHCR. And this uh, very in uh, 2019, our Home Affairs, a state of Minister of State for Home Affairs, Kiran Vijju, told the Lok Sabha, Lok Sabha is the lower house of Indian Parliament, told that around 30,000 people belonging to the minority communities like Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, Jain, and Christians coming from countries, various countries, especially our neighborhood countries. So I guess the refugees problem in India is mainly from its neighborhood countries. Besides this, there are very, uh, there are several reports on how many refugees in India, including the Rohingyas, are sent back to their home countries after facing this, uh, detention and without any consultation with UNHCR. Like, uh, as uh, in India, there are many allegations that uh, we are not uh, following the UNHCR guidelines, especially when the things come to Rohingyas. There is a like uh, one uh, thing I want to mention that in as per Indian culture, we used to follow. Uh, uh, we used to follow the belief that Atiti Devo Bhavo means uh, guest is like a goat. We should consider our guest as a goat and refuses are a goat, goat like to us. But, uh, but uh, there is like a dark side to this fact also as many of the refuses who come to India are, are involved in terrorist activities. That's why Indian government adopt a uh, strong action and try to send them back to their country without consulting UNHCR. If we talk about why India is not signing this 1951 Refugee Convention of UN, then India is not signing it because it only uh, related to the violation of civil and political rights. It doesn't talk about economic rights. And that's why India is uh, not uh, signing it. On the other hand, this argument, if we use in South Asian context, then it could be a problematic provision for, for India, as India is already a very, uh, very large number of population. And if we need to adjust the refugees, then it would be really uh, problematic for India. Now, if we talk about the challenges associated with India's refugee policies, then there is a problem with our definition of refugees and immigrants. In the recent past, many people from neighboring countries tend to illegally immigrate to India, not because of state petitions, but in search of better economic opportunities in India. While the reality is that much of the debate in the country is about illegal immigrants, not refugees. The two categories tend to get bunched together. Due to these policies and remedies to deal with these issues, suffer from a lack of clarity as well as pol policy utility. So we can see like there is a lot of confusion about refugees and immigrants. Like uh, we exactly don't know how to differentiate between these two because people used to come in the form of immigration, but they are actually refuses. 
so this double masking of people where they wear the mask of immigrants is really hard to face so ambiguity in the framework is also a problem uh, the main reason why our policies towards illegal immigrations and refugees are confused is that as per indian law both category of people are used as one and the same and are covered under the foreigners act 1946 so you can see the the ambiguity is also a problematic concern for india besides this this adoptism discriminatory cca is also a problem from indian perspective like uh, the last two years back when the CCA, the Citizenship Amendment Act was passed in India, there was a new huge, uh, huge uh, like uh, political oppositions, uh, like India was blamed that it, it should not pass such an act where it would differentiate among the citizenship on the basis of its reason. But still the Indian Parliament has passed it. If we talk about the demography profile in India, then India is home to 2.44 lakhs refugees and asylum seekers. And out of this 2.44 lakhs, almost 2 lakhs refugees are from Sri Lanka, Tibet, and 40, almost 40,000 are of other nations. There are nearly half a million Nepali immigrants residing in India. In fact, there are 3.2 million Bangladeshi immigrants. So you can see that refugees are coming from all over the neighborhood countries. We have a refugees from Bangladesh, we have a refugees from Nepal, we have a refugees from Pakistan, we have refugees from Afghanistan, we have refugees from Sri Lanka, we have refugees from Myanmar. So India has a lot of burden on its uh, states where the refugees are continue, uh, continuously used to come. And in fact, the thing is that, that the Indian government doesn't maintain any record of refuses and blame it on their clandestine movement. Since such foreign nations, refugee, asylum seeker, a stateless people entered into the country without valid travel documents. So it was also led by the Minister of State for Home Affairs, Nityanand Rai, in Lok Sabha. Uh, it's a statistic, so like in 2020, if you see there is a 0.15 increase from 2019, the fusion statistics. Like also, we can see that since 2016, the statistics of the fusions are just going uh, upwards. Some somewhere it's a decline. You can see clearly from my table, like in so. 2020 it's a plus in 2019 it's a minus 18 it's again minus 17 it's again minus so it's a oh, like at some moment we see that many refugees are coming at some moment we see that uh, the number of refugees decreasing so it's a both it's a mix of both like uh, in some years the uh, refugees are coming in so much number whether in another year that the refugees just go decrease so if we talk about the uh, measure implemented by India during COVID-19, especially with refugees, then we can say that the Indian government has implemented, uh, implemented a series of measures, including declaring masks and sanitizers as essential commodity, stepping up its contact tracing and testing efforts, permitting private labs to conduct testing and announcing the relief package to address the immediate need of the poor and others in need of urgent assistance. The central government, that is our Modi government, also set up uh, hunger centers and initiated a migrant mapping pro protocol to make relief measures accessible to them. Like why I am talking about migration? Because in India, many refugees come in the form of migration, migrant people also. Most recently, the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court of India, that is located in Delhi, has been involved in matter related to the provision of basic necessities and payment of minimum wages to workers and ensure that people covered by government flagship uh, healthcare scheme were able to access free COVID-19 testing at private level. However, despite all this measure, the plight of refugees in India is still very Like they are, they don't have much. Uh, access to the any benefits that are that are provided by the government because like the, in india the policies are really made uh, in a golden way but their implementation is really slow 
So in conclusion, I would like to say that in spite of being a party to the 1951 Refugee Convention, or not, sorry, not being a party to the 1951 Refugee Convention and 1961, 1967 Protocol, India has been one of the largest recipients of the refugees in the world. However, if India has domestic legislation regarding refugees, it could have been better and oppressive government in the neighborhood to pursue their population and make them free to India. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Yeah, sorry. I forgot to uh, unmute myself. Thank you, Dr. Minaj. I think your angle in looking how India as the biggest recipient and not um, accepting to the um, convention is a sort of a unique thing to dive in more later in the discussion. Thank you. So I would like to pass the microphone to um, Mikro. Um, I think the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Just to clarify, you want me to answer your question in regards to COVID? Do you want me to go ahead with my presentation? Just no. Make sure I... The question is simple, Michael. What is the state of handling refugees nowadays, particularly in the middle of COVID? How COVID has become the game changer in handling the refugees and also the people of concern? Okay. So exactly, in regards to COVID, uh, I think that there are two main reflections which uh, uh, need to be made. The first one about COVID is that I think it emphasized the health crisis, which uh, uh, often affects the refugee crisis uh, all over the world. I think this has been a global issue. And um, another element which has been uh, uh, highlighted by the COVID pandemic and the refugee crisis, uh, again, globally, is the competition for medical services uh, between the and services in general between the hosting state and the refugees in the country. Uh, while on one side we have this negative aspect of competition between uh, the hosting state and the refugees for uh, services, including uh, ventilators, uh, medical staff, uh, quarantine services, we also had at the same time, I think, uh, um, an understanding that in a way refugee problems uh, are, are our problems as well, and we need to solve them, uh, solve our own. Because uh, uh, as we saw in, in refugee, especially in Europe, I think this, this happened the case, but also, also in Asia, in Bangladesh, uh, where we had Rohingya refugees in numbers. We saw that if uh, the uh, COVID outbreaks are not uh, uh, addressed in refugee camps, uh, if they're not refugee, uh, addressed among refugee populations, then those problems will spill over into uh, the hosting country and other countries uh, nearby. So I think that the, the COVID uh, uh, pandemic in this regard has uh, provided a very um, uh, kind of a very, in a way, contradictive uh, uh, answer to the refugee issue. On one side, it has provided this competition element. Uh, but on the other is help us see the refugee issue as something much more uh, holistic to address. Uh, and so and it's shown that our issues uh, are their issues as well. So I think that's the main way the, the COVID pandemic has been uh, uh, affecting the refugee issue. Then, of course, another way the refugee crisis uh, uh, globally and in Asia has been um, affected by the COVID pandemic is that it has been obscured. Uh, COVID pandemic has uh, inevitably become the uh, headlines so of all over the countries, including Indonesia right now. I think that in Indonesia, what the journal newspapers are talking about at the moment is only about COVID-19 uh, and the spike of deaths, which has been very recently. So there is, of course, the issue that the refugee crisis has been put into obscurity in terms of media reporting. Uh, again, there is this positive element uh, that uh, the COVID pandemic has brought about uh, understanding the very sure our issues in a much more holistic uh, uh, manner. So I think that that will be my take in regards to COVID-19 and uh, refugees. Thank you, Micro. A good angle in talking refugees and also COVID-19 is a thing like a uh, contradicting in a way. So I think we all also will discuss that further. So I will pass the microphone last to Ibu Sylvia. What do you think about the state of handling refugees nowadays in Asia? Okay, thank you, Calvin, for the opportunity. Um, thank you, Alsa, IEPS, and FPCI. Um, the beauty of being the last one, um, everything is pretty much covered by <laughs> everyone. But actually, um, my points uh, are echoing uh, what Brian um, um, pointed out at the beginning. And let me just um, choose to put some flesh to the skeletons that you have um, built there, Brian. Um, so, um, I would like to use numbers to, to put the, 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 the problems into context. Um, 
right now, um, the latest data, it's uh, from UN Refugee in 2021, um, 1.44 million refugees need urgent resettlement. That's, that's the number. Uh, but only 22,770 refugees resettled in uh, 2020. That's a reduction of 80% uh, compared to 2019. So that's the condition. And I don't think it's uh, very much improving into 2021. And then um, only 57% uh, refugee hosting countries include refugees in their vaccination plan. So we do have countries who, who, who provide vaccines to, to uh, refugees, but it's only 57% of, uh, of the refugee hosting countries. And 85% 80, refugees are in low to middle income countries that have financial challenges and insufficient healthcare system. That's the reality. So um, bearing those numbers in mind, I would like um, to, do a little flashback of what happened to our fellow um, human being, uh, the refugees. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, we still remember the boat case around our countries, right? Uh, refugees became, became an issue that no country would want to deal with. However, uh, we still have countries like Bangladesh who, who welcomed them. Um, while others, I don't want to mention who, who, who refused, uh, we, we all know that. But then uh, towards um, immediately after, after the pandemic uh, was declared, um, ASEAN Special Summit on COVID-19 has called for joint action and a whole society approach in handling the pandemic. And after that, UNSCR um, also um, in November, 2020, the UNSCR um, has re-emphasized uh, the principle of leaving no one behind um, to be included in national health plans uh, as a means to ensure inclusive policies that provide health access for everyone. So it's a global call to, to include in the, in the general um, mitigation plan for, for each country. However, we have come to the stage now where um, these are the challenges, uh, at least some of the challenges faced by the refugees during COVID-19. Um, of course, um, I think you agree with me that um, uh, we have an issue of insufficient space in camps or detention center or whatever you call them um, to do social distancing. Um, this is not exclusive to refugees. Uh, I think in Indonesia, we also had this issue with um, prisons and and the dilemma here is whether to set them free or to keep them safe in quotes within that 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 um, um, confinement um, lack of access to water and sanitation um, this is a classic issue but but then uh, it amplified um, limited to no access to national health care system of course unemployment and, and economic hardship lack of connectivity and access to technology to continue education, uh, poor identity documentation to obtain any kind of support. So basically it's um, the same problems, but amplified. So I would like to use that um, as, a, uh, as a keyword to describe um, uh, what's the state um, of condition of the refugee and also um, the, the policies. It's, um, it is amplified. The problems they are uh, facing are, uh, are amplified and the policies should also be amplified. Um, I, I would like to go back uh, a little bit to the vaccine um, uh, issue. Um, I found at least um, Nepal, Indonesia, Iran, India, and Pakistan are giving um, vaccines to, to um, as of March or June 2021, giving vaccines to the refugees. But then if you look at the numbers, Nepal is 72, Indonesia 912, um, 
Iran, the number is not mentioned, but um, focusing on those uh, above 65. India, around um, 1,456, um, but maybe Minaxi can, can um, update on that. Pakistan, around 44. So percentage-wise, it's not that big. So that's the problem. So we, we have to go back to the issue of resources, availability of resources. It is mentioned that UNSCR needs around $455 million in sub supplementary needs and $469 million in COVID-related activities. But uh, until now, they only uh, received $252.8 million or 27% of the, the those uh, resources required. So if we go into details, um, we are still a little bit behind. Well, not a little bit, but yeah, there are a lot of things to do. But yes, um, I'll give it back to you, Calvin. Thank you, Dr. Sylvia. I think you highlighted a very important keyword this night, which is amplification we need to amplify it not only the problem is amplified but also the, the policy should be amplified and emancipated more yeah. so i want to bring the discussion into spec i want to talk about legal and also about political social and also security i think this is a very interesting dimensions to discuss so let me start with the legal one i know we have brian here so i want to also refer this question to Ibu Sylvie, Dr. Sylvie, and also Dr. Um, to, to Dr. Minaj. Um, Brian, we know that a lot of, you mentioned it earlier, that a lot of con countries um, has not acceded to the convention, right? And however, they're uh, doing it, right? They are doing uh, what the moral obligation they should do. And we are lucky tonight because we have Dr. Sylvie from Indonesia and also Dr. Minaj from India, both two countries which are not considered to the convention. So we can also amplify this question. The question is simple. Um, in your perspective, are they doing obligation adequately, even though they're outside the convention? Do you think they are doing adequately? Uh, not also Indonesia and also India, but also in general terms. And how is the principle of non-revolvement in practice? So because non-revolvement sometimes become a debate, in particular in some um, countries between, even Indonesia also has a problem with other countries about that. So I wanna refer that question to you first. And I would like to refer to Ibu Silfi from Indonesian perspective. Are, are Indonesian, is Indonesian doing um, adequately, do you think? And also how about from Indian perspective? So Brian, please. Thank you very much. Um, the question of adequacy is maybe from one perspective, a tough one, but maybe from another perspective, easy because no country in the world is maybe doing it adequately. Um, you know, the question about um, obligations, I, I really appreciated the way that you just framed it actually, because um, are states obligated to protect refugees? I think the, the quick and easy answer is yes. But what is the source of those obligations? And do states actually respect those obligations in practice? As for the source of the obligations, there are legal ones. Um, there are also moral and ethical ones. There are socio-political ones, and there are humanitarian ones. Um, and all of those obligations are relevant. So it does no good to talk about one to the exclusion of all others. Um, it's useful when we're talking about refugees to talk about any and all of those obligations. Um, I also appreciated Meenakshi referring to, you know, the domestic regulations in India. Um, and historically, refugees weren't invented in 1951 when the convention came about. They also weren't invented in, you know, 1920 with the League of Nations. Refugees are an ancient and universal concept. If, if you look at ancient history in India, you have the Parsi 1,400 years ago granted asylum and are still well integrated in India. Um, every country in Asia is the same. They have 
engaged. Uh, they have been dis had displacement themselves. They have welcomed the stranger. These kinds of obligations, I think, are really important to consider. Um, now, when you talk about adequacy, when you what what we really need to do is be very um, realistic and pragmatic. Who are the people that are there, and what are their needs? Are their needs being met? The the answer to that question in most contexts is no. Um, the, the needs are not being met adequately. There are a lot of needs that are going unaddressed. Um, the focus is on basic life-saving uh, humanitarian assistance and therefore things like livelihoods or education um, or, you know, day-to-day -day healthcare needs are generally not being met. Um, but these are all human rights. Um, and, you know, human rights are owed to humans, not citizens, right? So the vast majority of human rights apply to refugees. Um, so you have legal obligations and, you know, Indonesia has a right to um, political asylum in its constitution. So putting aside international law, domestic law is there in a lot of different jurisdictions. So there are legal obligations, there are moral obligations. And if we look at um, whether states are respecting it in practice, um, the answer is yes and no. Um, so we, we are seeing um, respect for non refoulement generally. It doesn't mean that people are not refooled, but generally states would never admit to that. What states say they're doing is that they're deporting irregular migrants. They would never admit to deporting refugees. They would say that the people that they're deporting are not refugees. And they make an effort to, to say that. That's because they recognize that there's an obligation to protect, a responsibility to protect. And that doesn't mean that refugees are not deported, that they are not refooled, they are in practice. And there is quite often in the headlines um, and quite often not in the headlines, uh, refoulement that you, you can see taking place and a lot of criticism of it. But there are also a lot of cases, uh, cases going to court, um, cases that don't go to court because states you know, find a way um, to ensure that they are respecting the principle of non refoulement I would also emphasize that the non refoulement obligation is in the Refugee Convention, but it's also in the Convention Against Torture, and it's also in the International Co Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And many of the Asian states have signed the ICCPR and this, the CAT, the CAT, the Convention Against Torture, even if they haven't signed the Refugee Convention. And it's also considered a principle of customary international law. So even where uh, a state hasn't signed up to the Convention Against Torture, they're still not allowed to torture. That would be illegal, even if they haven't signed that particular convention. So with refoulement, it's the same. Um, just because a state hasn't signed the Refugee Convention doesn't mean that they're permitted to deport refugees back to genocide or something like that. So these legal obligations are already binding. Um, there are domestic legal obligations. There are moral and ethical ones and humanitarian ones. And I think it's useful to consider all of those obligations um, and to advocate along those lines. Some are going to be more persuasive than others in a particular context. Thanks. Mm. A quick quick questions, Brian, to you. I want to add, and also we'll add this questions to Dr. Sylvia and also to me. How do you see the, the political will in, in countries that hosted a large amount of uh, refugees? how far the political will is growing in the capital, um, Brian? Um, political will is weak, generally speaking, I think, but we do see developments. So Indonesia passed a presidential decree in 2016. Um, that's a great example. Bangladesh welcomed a million in 2017, people fleeing genocide. I mean, these are important things to recognize and applaud. Um, but I happen to believe that, um, you know, we, we should start with the protection, start with the people and their needs, um, and build capacity to meet those needs in practice. Just start delivering protection now. 
And you can pull political will along in your wake. I actually think the Achenese fishermen are the perfect example of that. They didn't wait around. There were people in need and they pulled them ashore. And then the political will came following along in its wake saying, okay, yes, we need to do something. And that's really what the impetus of the presidential decree in 2016 was. It was the proactive actions, humanitarian actions of local actors. And so I think the local actors and their actions are what are going to generate the political will. And so we should be focusing our efforts there. Thank you, Brian. Same question to you, Dr. Minaj, from Indian perspective, please. From Indian perspective, then the, uh, like, as we know, like India is not signatory to 1951 UN Convention, but still India is allowing or providing asylum to uh, like many of the refugees. As for example, India provides asylum to Jews who has been persecuted around the world as well as thousands of Sri Lankan Tamils who have flew, uh, flew from their homeland onto the army military country. Apart from that, India has also taken Tibetans, Afghans, and migrants from other various nations. But whenever it comes to the Rohingya Muslims, things almost change. This reality has also been confirmed by the army. Last UN uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres on multiple occasions. Like for example, I would uh, like to discuss one recent judgment of our Indian Supreme Court. It's a judgment on Muhammad Salim Mullah. The government recently devoted, uh, decided to deport 150 to 160 Rohingya. They were detained in Jammu. Jammu is a uh, one state in India, and this. Uh, Government order was challenged in the recent case of Muhammad Salimullah versus Union of India. The government reasons for its action against the Rohingya was that they were foreigners who came from another country seeking asylum, and the Indian government was authorized to regulate their entry under Section 3 of the Foreigner Acts, as I discussed earlier, for national security concern and non applications of the principle of non refoulement on India due to its being a non-signatory to this refusing conditions. So the Supreme Court of India ruled in favor of the government and allowed the deportation of the Rohingyas with due processes. So this really show the black side of uh, India's moral obligations where on the other hand, we allow the refuses from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, even from Nepal, but don't know when the things come to Rohingya then the whole the uh, good side become the bad side because the Indian government always put, put a question that Rohingyas are a threat to national security. So on this uh, ground of this uh, national security, Indian government is not convinced to accept the Rohingyas always. In fact, thank you, Dr. Shil. Yeah, thank you. Yes, you can continue, Dr. Minaj, if you have. Yeah, in fact, uh, India always like uh, give a reason that as India is not signatory, so you, you can't bound us. It's totally up to us whether we want to accept any refusal or not. This was uh, clearly evident in the recent mm, Thank you. It, interesting, you mentioned about the security as well. Um, often the time refugees associated with those things, but, but let the uh, circle back to that point later on. Dr. Sophie, same questions. Yes, um, I think um, policy-wise, Brian has mentioned um, uh, what Indonesia has um, taken the initiative. But um, again, um, I tried to use this keyword. Um, uh, there is one word in Indonesian said keniscayaan, and I, I Googled it in English, and it's inevitability. Um, signing or not, um, we do have refugees in our territory. And that's that's another, I mean, that's an experience for other countries too, which are neighboring to a conflict country, uh, a country in conflict or, or on the way um, to another more promising country. Um, so it, they are there. Um, so it is our choice as a country, as a nation, whether to um, only tick the boxes, uh, just a matter of doing it, or actually um, go to the extent, to a certain extent. Um, so um, a matter, if, you, if the question is, are we doing something for the refugees? Yes, 
but then the question is how much and 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 um what changed i think is that um in the past indonesia can um kind of put the refugees in a certain place or 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 you know like like um just put them there and 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 um kind of ignore um, um some of the some of the needs however uh, during the pandemic that cannot be done uh, because whatever happened to them will also affect um, the society i mean it has been like that but um during the pandemic the the the, the idea uh, that um i wear the mask to save you and you wear the mask to save me and that kind of, of explain the interaction between the refugees and and the, the society as a whole um so um the need to include them in the policies um has become higher um so if if we go back to the question have we done enough um it's inevitable inevitable um um we cannot separate them from the the rest of the society anymore and and i think that's what's happening at the grassroots level um when when vaccines are given um it's for everyone who lives in that area so hopefully this will um, contribute to a better um, attention or a, a better concern towards the refugees as a whole. Thank you, Dr. Silvi. I wanna move the discussion towards the political security and also the social dimensions of the refugees. I wanna to talk to you, you directly, Mikro, about we are now what's happening in Hong Kong and also what's happening in Myanmar and a lot of uh, hotspot, I would say, in Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific about the political happenings there. And a lot of political asylum seekers that uh, now is coming out and looking for this, uh, the host country for the security of the political um, in the, that dimension. My easy question straight to you, in your, observation what is the state of political asylum handling in in host countries right uh, and what are the challenges for political asylum seekers nowadays Micro. thank you very much and thank you for mentioning those uh, uh, case studies so uh, i started with hong kong yeah? and uh, the reason why i um, devoted a lot of interest to it uh, so articles which i've written as well as uh, bring some material for this uh, uh, panel is because hong kong uh, uh, represents an amazing uh, uh, case study uh, of application of international law, of uh, state responsibilities from a normative viewpoint, and uh, as well as uh, a, a relationship between the international and the national and how the two um, go together. So in terms of uh, uh, Hong Kong again, so we recently saw in 2019 with the introduction of the extradition bill, so ironically from a very uh, law-related uh, uh, event, we started having massive protests uh, in the country, and uh, essentially the trickle down effect from those protests have been the enactment by the uh, People's Republic of China of the national security law, which applies to Hong Kong and has a uh, worldwide jurisdiction, um, which uh, presents a challenge of, uh, uh, in terms of freedom of expression in the country, as well as security of those who express their opinions. So uh, there are many kinds of refugees. Some there are environmental refugees escaping from environmental disaster. We have uh, refugees escaping from uh, Health crisis, we have refugees escaping from war, but also political refugees, and that's the case uh, of Hong Kong. And uh, Hong Kong is particularly uh, interesting because uh, um, changing the way uh, the, a sentence from Brian before, who said that uh, just uh, uh, because uh, a country doesn't sign the 1961 Convention, or whatever other international element, uh, it doesn't mean that they do not protect uh, uh, refugees uh, or they send them back. Uh, in this, the Hong Kong has shown uh, the opposite, that just because the country signs, uh, the 1951 Convention, it doesn't mean that those refugees will receive assistance. This has been shown with a country nearby to Hong Kong uh, in its relationship with uh, migrants, which is Taiwan. Taiwan is a fairly um, extreme case uh, in which they have no refugee law at all. This is, uh, this is quite significant because they signed the Convention very early. They also signed the 1967 Protocol, and uh, they do not have uh, any uh, refugee law, which means that when a refugee comes to the country, unless they come there on a tourist visa, get jailed because they are classified as illegal migrants according to the um, Act 1999. And 
why is it relevant related to Hong Kong is because uh, the refugee issue with Taiwan uh, was highlighted by the Hong Kong uh, by Hong Kong people trying to flee to, to Taiwan, which presented a, a significant uh, uh, challenge in that regard uh, and brought the spotlight uh, lack of legislative uh, uh, protection which the country gave to um, uh, to refugees are seeking or refugees actually asylum seekers, given that they are not welcome, they're not refugees, uh, uh, sadly, asylum seekers uh, um, to the country. So that's uh, the way the uh, Hong Kong case is very, is very interesting. Again, in regards to this, to this interest in this connection to, to Taiwan, I think that um, um, Hong Kong and the uh, refugee crisis in this sense, but it's not, it's not necessarily a crisis, but um, uh, Taiwan has shown that. Uh, uh, refugee welcoming can have uh, uh, positive effects uh, on the country welcoming them at a political level. So I think that one uh, is missing an opportunity to be to have its sovereignty recognized uh, by accepting refugees from Hong Kong. Uh, Taiwan has been in recent years uh, uh, striving a lot uh, to highlight its uh, um, its existence uh, not as uh, another China or as part of China, but as the distinctly Taiwanese nation, it's despite speaking Chinese, despite uh, uh, having a, a Chinese culture in many ways, uh, the, Hong Kong uh, has been pushing towards being more Taiwan. Uh, sorry, not, not Hong Kong. Sorry, Taiwan has been pushing towards being uh, increasingly an independent nation, not connected to China per se. And by accepting refugees from uh, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan can uh, strengthen its uh, claims of sovereignty and independence uh, from the country. It's uh, uh, undoubtedly a, a very interesting way in which we can see uh, policy and politics uh, merge with refugee. Um, Issues. This is the first element in regards to Hong Kong. The third case about Hong Kong uh, is uh, uh, shown that uh, countries have uh, um, sometimes there are, there are more conventions uh, to those which we are used to, such as the 1961 one or the 1967 protocol, which is the relationship between Hong Kong uh, and Britain. Three, uh, so, uh, as you know, Britain signed an uh, agreement with China when they ceded Hong Kong, uh, in which they had, uh, had guarantees that Hong Kong would have. Uh, its uh, economic and social system maintained, and at the same time, we saw Britain has not stepped up in any way in terms of refugee uh, welcoming uh, from Hong Kong, uh, despite the fact that uh, agreement was breached. So we did introduce the DNO, which is a British uh, Overseas Nationality uh, Visa program, but we never scaled it up to a refugee level for those people fleeing from Hong Kong, except on a case-by-case -case study, such as the case of Nathan Law. So I think that in that case, Hong Kong again has shown that. Uh, relationship uh, how uh, a refugee crisis gets, ha gets, gets handled by different uh, uh, countries such as Taiwan which has, doesn't have an uh, uh, refugee law or Britain which has responsibility towards uh, Hong Kong uh, uh, citizens and that's the that's the, the first element uh, in regards to uh, Hong Kong now because I don't want to take too much time uh, on the presentation so I will uh, avoid talking about Myanmar at this stage uh, but I'm happy to go back to it uh, uh, with further questions uh, uh, other speakers have a chance to, to speak and comment in regards to it. And also, I wish to thank uh, uh, Sylvia for her comment about uh, Indonesia and how the refugee crisis and COVID again has shown uh, how uh, the issues are there. Sir. I like for the mask example, and I think that's, that's very accurate uh, in representing the current refugee understanding uh, uh, today. So, thank you, Calvin. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Micro. Because of the interest of the time, um, I only have a one slot of questions. And also we move to the question coming from the participants. So this question, I will give the opportunities to all the speakers to participate. So my question is about the dilemma. It's came from, it's come from my observation that there is a dilemma between returning the refugees home um, by the host countries and, and the other is integrating them to the society, to the system right in any kind giving them pr or even citizenship or empowering them with um education everything you, you know what i mean so how do we see this issue and how we should frame it because often the time it's become a domestic political um, associated and become a political debate and sometimes that political debate will decrease the political will of the country and even give no every benefit um, to to what's happening in the ground right to the, to the refugees right we are knowing that here in indonesia there are um was in the national headline how a lot of afghans um, or even others refugees has been here for decades with no legal status or even a very clear economic uh path of their for them future 
So how do we see these two dilemmas, right? So I want to start from Dr. Uh, I want to start with I want to start with Dr. Minaj, India perspective. Uh, like the answer perhaps lie in a new domestic law aimed at refugees. Like as the Indian government has passed the CAA, the Citizenship Amendment Act in 2019. However, the Indian government by passing the CAA is like we can solve the problem of refugees and immigrant migrations, but still the problem is not easily to solve, get solved. But it's perhaps equally important is that we should have a domestic refugee law, law which would focus so uh, mainly on the temporary shelter and work permit for refugees. As we have seen during the COVID-19, refugees uh, easily uh, don't get uh, any kind of facilities or access to the welfare, welfare schemes as they don't have access to welfare schemes for of health, free health care. Uh, like, so I think we need a as if I talk about from Indian perspective, then we really need a domestic refugee law, which would mainly focus on the work permit and their access to the government welfare schemes. Dr. Mina, just a quick follow-up question to you. How far the refugees issue associated with terrorism and other security-related issue? Like if I talk from Indian perspective, then Indian government used to say that Rohingyas are really a threat to national security because they are mostly found in terrorist activities. So I guess so, like that, this uh, refugees are really connected to the terrorist activities. Thank you, Dr. Minaj. Same questions to Dr. Shilpi about the dilemmas. I think for Indonesia, it's more like economic factor whether we, we are capable of taking care of them or not. Um, I think it, it, it goes from the top to the bottom. I mean, even, even at, the, at the grassroots level within the society, as long as they are not, um, how do I say, troubling um, the society, they are well accepted. Um, I guess that's the nature of the society. Like um, um, you are welcome. I, I, I noticed the, the, the principle from India, from Minashi um, um, about the guest. Um, we are more or less like that. Uh, um, th that's the difference. But then when it comes to economic uh, issues, like um, giving them uh, the, the, care, the care that they need, and then the, the, the government will think twice. That's the problem. And um, sadly, and this is from a personal experience. Um, um, the younger generation in Indonesia, um, I don't know whether it's the media or, or the government in a way, um, when, when they are asked, what do you think about uh, refugees? And they, there, are, there are young generations in, in, in Indonesia who will say, no, we better not accept them because they will become a burden for us. Uh, that's the word, burden. Um, and I think it refers to economic capability. And, and I think um, that's similar in any other countries, um, whether it's on refugees or migrants or even international students. Uh, when they know it will take the taxpayers' money, um, there will be questions raised. That's usually the, the case. Thank you, Dr. Shelfi. Brian, how it comes in the bigger picture of the regions about the dilemma questions? Um, well, first, I would say that I think the question demonstrates that we need to rethink pretty much everything. Um, even the question is a very state-centric perspective. Should we send them home or should we let them locally integrate? That's a gross oversimplification of it when you think, I mean, each person has so many different aspects to their life, so many connections with different peoples and cultures. It's unrealistic to speak in these, you know, one size fits all approaches. That's, 
that states try to do that and it never works because you can't draw these kinds of lines between people. Um, even these legal categories we create are, are not very realistic. So I think um, when you talk about solutions, you need to be talking about solutions from the very beginning. That needs to be part of the discussion from day one. And every possible solution needs to be on the table, not only one, or in the worst case scenario, none on the table. So, you know, it's not just a matter of one or the other. Every single solution needs to be on the table at all times if we have any hope of achieving solutions. Otherwise, we will end up with tremendous backlogs and protracted situations, and we won't be able to cope with that. I, I really appreciated earlier um, Sylvia's reference to the whole of society approach. I think that captures what the rethink needs to be. Um, I think that you know we need everyone um, engaging with each other and supporting each other and seeing each other as part of the same family. Um, and you know, it's impossible when you look at the scope of the needs, uh, the, the, the newest figures from UNHCR that you gave, it's more than 1% of the global population are refugees now. And that's because it's a growing figure. That's a new large number. It's never been that high. Um, so we're facing something, you know, states tend to look at the refugees within their own borders, but this isn't limited to their own you know, territory, this is happening everywhere. This is happening in every single jurisdiction. So I think the focus needs to be on responsibility sharing. But right now, the focus is on responsibility avoidance. And that is a common approach among all states, mm -hmm. uh, developed, signatory, non-signatory. It is responsibility avoidance. That, that is the common international policy uh, for refugees. And it needs to be turned on its head and it needs to be responsibility sharing. Um, I mean, I would just say one th more thing, which is that I think for each of us, um, you know, we're not the president or prime minister or king of a country, and we can't just change a policy. But what we can do is welcome refugees, live with them, talk to them, and we will soon see that it is no longer them, it is us. And we're all in this together. And I think that kind of grassroots, on the ground, local engagement with refugees is really important. I would also just say that, you know, when we talk about, I, I think it's, it's real, the state fear of economic burden is real. But research has shown time and again that what refugees and immigrants give back, including economically, far exceeds the cost, the, the minor cost of you know, welcoming them. What, what needs to happen is that all these bureaucratic hurdles need to be removed. Because if a refugee were just there, they would be working and contributing to the local economy. And that would be good for everyone. So, you know, it's, it's hard to get there because there are a lot of um, politics involved. And there's a lot of fear and bigotry. And these things are hard to overcome. There's some ethnocentrism, you know, this is our culture and these people are different, you know, but, you know, as we move into the future, people are not going to travel less. Um, their technology is going to continue to improve people are, we're going to be interacting with each other more and more. That's just the reality. And the sooner states recognize that reality and start managing it, as opposed to trying to prevent it, um, you know, the better things will get. Perfect, perfect, Brian. I want to continue the discussion and debate about that point, right? I, I want to talk more about the, the missing elements that the blind spot dimension of policy that countries have uh, been missing. But because of the interest of sign, I need to move. So... I want to directly jump into the questions from the participants, right? Um, so I have uh, one question. Um, I think this is anonymous. I don't know where it comes from, but it obviously from the participant. So the question is about what is the most effective policy to avoid threats from refugees without ignoring the principles of human rights? Maybe there's an element of security in that question as well. So. Uh, so who wants to go first about these questions? 
Dr. Sylvie, you're always um, nudging your health, you know. So <laughs> I, I, I believe you, you are very excited to speak about this. Please, doctor. Um, I, I would say start by changing the question. <laughs> like, you know, like not seeing them as a threat. I think that's the most <laughs> effective policy. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. So here's the thing. Why it become a perception of public, in particular in Indonesia, but Dr. Minaj, is it is it this is the the perspective the perspective in India looking there as a threat or, or what, what is uh, in India? Like in India, there is this, like many critics used to say that we already have a population of almost one uh, one hundred thirty four crores. Then why we are not ready to accept the refugees who are just two lakhs? So hmm. in this big population of one. 134 road it easily are just two lakh people so we should welcome refugees they are people like this also who are really willing to welcome the refugees mm. micro you want to add yeah i'm very happy actually to add on, on the matter so we talked about refugees uh, as a threat and i think uh, making a step back is very useful in this case so uh, seeing refugees as a threat uh, again goes back to what ryan is talking about of seeing uh, uh, refugees as a state issue, the welcoming state issue, as well as uh, refugees as, uh, as, uh, as an issue per se, uh, rather than, than a phenomenon, which has a cause. So we talk about uh, uh, countries uh, having a, a rhetoric of avoidance, avoidance of refugees. Uh, and uh, I think that the, this, this laziness is reflected also in preventing uh, refugees from uh, uh, becoming refugees. So uh, what makes someone become a refugee? And uh, I think that uh, in, in Asia especially, We've seen a lot of lack of state intervention to prevent crises uh, to get to a point in which we have massive refugees, uh, uh, refugee waves coming through. An example is Myanmar. I think that Myanmar has been in a, in a, in a politically gangrenous state for years. Uh. They had uh, multiple coups, including one recently. We had uh, the Rohingya crisis, which is undoubtedly uh, one of the worst humanitarian crisis we have in the, in the, in the world, uh, which is why Myanmar is one of the top five countries in terms of uh, refugees uh, leaving the country. Yet we did not have an inch of robust state intervention in Myanmar. There is a tool which was developed about 20 years ago, which is called uh, responsibility to protect. The concept about responsibility to protect is that uh, a group of countries, or even a single country by mandate of the UN, violates the sovereignty of a country to intervene in it in order to prevent uh, uh, what is defined as serious harm to human beings. And uh, I think that in Asia, there's been, at least let's talk about Asia is in South Asia, Southeast and East Asia. There, is a, there has been a massive reluctance to use this tool. It has been used a lot more in Africa. It has been used extensively in Europe. And in the case of uh, uh, Europe and Serbia and Kosovo, it has proved extremely successful preventing humanitarian disasters from occurring. So I think that uh, um, the, when seeing refugees as a threat uh, is, is a reflection of, uh, of this avoidance, of this laziness by states uh, and by extension people who see their state uh, behaving the way it does, uh, of, uh, of seeing the refugee as, uh, as uh, a phenomenon, as something that which just exists, which doesn't have a cause, and uh, it doesn't have a cause which can be addressed. So I think that, uh, again, we need to make this step back uh, and try to resolve the issue of what causes refugees uh, uh, flee their countries, address it before the crisis is uh, uh, so, so terrible that there is no other choice but to welcome these people uh, on our shores. Uh, Mikro, I want to get back to you um, directly, sir, again, very follow-up questions. I want to talk to you related to the Rohingya, right? Uh, we haven't discussed that, you know, in this uh, short discussion. Um, Rohingya has been deeply associated not only politics, but also security up to the terrorism and radicalism. Rohingya, right? And um, there are some issues or even um, uh, an argument, even from Indonesian uh, security apparatus, that showing Rohingya is a, a sweet, a paradise home to develop radicalism um, because they are being oppressed, right? And what is your, what is your um, observations on that? We need to settle up that uh, issue. We need to, we, we push Indonesian government trying to push them back home to Myanmar. Myanmar should accept them. But the government saying, no, that particular group, there are some degree of group that which very national threat to us. So how we 
uh, see the complicated dimensions of refugees issues, not only a humanitarian, can be solved. What, what things that we should focus on if there is uh, related to the national security issues? Uh, Mike Mikro. Yeah, well, first of all, I don't think that ethnic cleansing uh, is a solution uh, bringing security to any state. I think that, that ethnic cleansing, uh, whatever is, is the aim of it, will not bring more security to a state. Now, uh, speaking of Myanmar particularly, we don't have only uh, an issue of uh, refugees in terms of ethnic refugees escaping from this cleansing, but there's also an issue of political refugees, uh, which is already uh, happening and will continue happening, people fleeing from persecution occurring due to the political views in regards to the recent coup. Like we had uh, persecution coming from the previous one, like in 1988. So uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the first issue is that, uh, uh, again, the, 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 main, the main point is that ethnic cleansing is not the answer to security. And uh, I think that when we have a state uh, which is pushing people out of their borders, uh, which is what is happening in, in Myanmar, whichever other reason why the government is doing it, uh, when we have uh, such an element of people being displaced, possibly uh, violently, even though there is uh, uh, naturally, there is conflict, like we have the current army, there is, there is war in Myanmar going on between uh, various groups and the government. Uh, even despite all of this, when we have a humanitarian crisis, we need to have uh, intervention in the country to prevent the humanitarian crisis from escalating to the point it did in Myanmar and is still continuing. And on the other side, when refugee, of course, is uh, re the refugee issue becomes uh, unavoidable, uh, like uh, Bangladesh, I think that Brian suggested that there should be a model of, uh, of sharing the refugee, uh, I don't want to use the, the word burden, but, but the our, our shared moral responsibility in terms of refugee um, um, rehousing, uh, I think that's, that's, that's the, the second element of the answer. But yeah, I definitely think that ethnic cleansing does not provide uh, uh, international security or national security to, to any country or region. Mm, thank you, Mikro. Brian, you want to add about that? Yeah, definitely. Um... I mean, first, I would just say that, um, you know, it's ironic, but the immigration detention, for example, particularly where conditions are dehumanizing um, or militarized borders and pushbacks at the borders, building of walls, these things actually undermine security. Um, so research has shown that it empowers traffickers. It prevents legal immigration and increases illegal immigration. So, you know, the actions that states are taking are largely exacerbating security situations. Um, the Rohingya situation and how exacerbated it is, is the perfect example. Um, this isn't a situation that started in 2017. The Rohingya have been, um, have were, became stateless in 1971 and have been persecuted uh, to the point of ethnic cleansing um, in, in recent days. And so, you know, this isn't new. This isn't something that suddenly there's an emergency and now we have to address it. This, this has been known for decades and states have avoided responsibility for a long time and that it remains the policy. So. Um, the Rohingya situation is one that I care about a great deal, and I believe that there isn't political will. Um, states are not stepping up to address this situation. Um, Bangladesh, for its uh, hosting of such large numbers, is basically on its own. And Bangladesh policies are also increasingly securitized. Um, and the space for protection is shrinking. And so what do we do? You know, what do we do when we're faced with such intractable um, situations politically? I continue to believe what I said before about political will, that we start by figuring out what the needs are of the Rohingya refugee population and the host communities, and we get to busy trying to meet those needs. And we hope and we continue to pull states along with us in that, um, in that effort, because it, this really is um, an example of states failing to, to their responsibility to protect, as Mirko um, described it. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So 
again, because of the interest of the time, we are running out of the time. It's supposed to be, we ended up in a few minutes. So I want to put some last short questions to everybody as a closing statement, right? So my question is simple. What is, or it could be has been, has been answered. What is the missing policy dimension by all state, by all countries that never see uh, in developing their refugee policy? Right, um, Brian talk about the sharing responsibility. I think that's a good approach. What is has been a missing dimension that actually people don't, the government don't see it until today because of a week of political will and leads into the very weak and minimum policy development of the refugees. So maybe um, who want to start? Maybe Micro. I want to give you the first floor. Yeah, I'm happy to. So, yeah, I think that the main missing element is prevention again. As, as I said before, I think prevention is the main uh, issue uh, which, uh, which states have been ignoring, uh, as well as international organizations. We have many tools to prevent refugees' uh, uh, crisis, so refugee crisis uh, which then led to mass refugees uh, uh, fleeing country uh, in question. I think that prevention has been largely ignored, and we have many tools which uh, we need to, uh, to, to use and update uh, in order to achieve that. Uh, uh, prevention element. Again, I mentioned before the R2P, which is a possibility to protect it, uh, and it's not, it has never been updated since 2001, and uh, it doesn't have, for instance, any uh, tools uh, for to address uh, uh, democracy's crisis. So I think that we have uh, uh, a need to uh, prevent it, and I think that's the main the main issue. Now, uh, if we instead don't want to make that step back, uh, and we want to focus uh, rather on the uh, on, on a situation, and in terms of once the refugees are here, what is the main issue? main issue is, uh, in a way, in integration. So we have many cases in which uh, refugees and, uh, and, uh, and the population live separately. Uh, an example is, as we've seen in, in Eastern and uh, Southeastern Europe, we have a lot of the phenomenon of refugees uh, cities uh, with no integration. Clearly, that system doesn't work. Uh, a refugee which is living in a, in a separately from society cannot econom economically contribute, it cannot economically um, merge with that society and integrate. And that, that is an issue, both in terms of the dignity of the, of the refugee is uh, uh, life uh, any status in terms of how, how it is, how he or she lives, uh, as well as in terms of the hosting state, which which clearly does not get any any advantage uh, and has any any compensation away from, from the refugee if he's kept uh, separate. An example of this is Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, refugees uh, and actually Hong Kong accepts very few refugees, but of the few which are accepted, uh, they cannot work, and, and this is critical because how, how can a refugee sustain himself uh, on a few government benefits? Uh, when he cannot work. At the same time, a Hong Kong resident would say, why are you giving benefits to him, this person, uh, when, when he or she could work? Uh, and if it goes for us, they can't legally. So there is this, this paradox. And I think that the answer, uh, when it is not prevention, it is to aim for successful integration, uh, at least for the case of refugees which cannot go back uh, in, the, in, in the long term. Naturally, if a refugee crisis is someone being displaced by a cyclone and they can go back in six months uh, after the, uh, the houses have been rebuilt, then that's another case. For long-term refugees, I think uh, integration is the most critical uh, element, which sometimes states fail to uh, recognize. Thank you. Dr. Silvi? Um, I would like to focus on transit countries, uh, the government of transit countries. I think um, the government, the policymakers need to get out of the illusion of um, refugees being temporary inhabitants, mm. um, because temporary for them can be um, years and years means that they have um, needs that needs to be fulfilled. Um, considering the, the state of uh, res resettlement process even before COVID and now after COVID, um, they have nowhere to go. And um, the government needs to be prepared for um, uh, service, providing service for the length of uh, their stay in our countries. So um, this illusion of um, refugees um, being temporarily settled in, in, in transit countries need to be changed. And it, you need to get out of that um, because um, at the end of the day, um, they need to be taken care. Um, I'll, I'll raise it there. Thank you. Dr. Minaj? Uh, from my point of view, I guess communication should be proper and effective between the host and native country of uh, this refuses. I guess with the government can uh, use all the three track track one where uh, track one where the 
government government official can discuss track two where the government institutions can discuss and the track three where the informal institutions can discuss about the remedies or another refuses so i guess uh, uh, communication should be proper and effective between the host and the native country thank you brian thanks i um maybe i want to highlight three policies and maybe one harsh reality uh, the harsh reality I'll start with is that um, there are going to be refugees for a long time yet to come. Um, we may achieve world peace someday, um, but until then, we are probably going to be faced with a certain number of refugees. So this isn't a problem that we can solve soon. It's going to be with us. Um, therefore, policy has to confront that reality. The idea that Sylvia mentioned about temporariness was attached to the Refugee Convention when it was drafted. UNHCR got two years at a time for until 2000 uh, something. So, you know, people expected this problem to be solved and go away, and it doesn't. And that was an unrealistic expectation, and that expectation needs to change. So, that's my harsh reality. My three policies that I think would make a huge difference. The first is refugee leadership and participation in decision-making, coordination and operations. Stop seeing them as passive recipients, start seeing them as active participants. Um, that's what they deserve and that's what they're already doing. Um, but there so much is about talking about them without them and that that needs to change. Uh, the second policy is responsibility sharing. So I think states need to get serious and start talking about how to share responsibilities with each other. Um, they have not been willing to do it um, because it's been, they've, they weren't willing to take any of the responsibility, but the reality is that they're all taking responsibility in really inefficient ways because they refuse to talk about responsibility sharing. And the last policy is a whole of society approach. And that's connected to responsibility sharing, but all of us can share responsibility for refugee protection, including alongside refugees themselves. Thanks. Perfect. I think those three points and also complemented with Dr. Silfi, with Mikro and also Dr. Minaj point become a conclusion that the refugee or even the people of concerns issues is a, a very continuous issues that will not last because of one event. And um, it's also multidimensional and the government, I think, should be more practical and should not be denial in looking how the refugees is coming in. And thank you very much to everybody who are coming. So before we close, I want to invite to have a photo shoot a photo shoot in the pandemic is totally changed. We don't use a camera, we use a screenshot. So that's a technology. If not been founded in years before, right? Maybe people missing the photograph in the two years of pandemic. So B, I want to offer back to you the comment to have a photo shoot of uh, all of us. Thank you, everyone. So if you can turn on your camera, I'll take a screenshot in a few seconds. Giving everyone a few more seconds to turn on their cameras. It's great to see all your beautiful faces. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna take the photo in five seconds. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Smile. Okay, let me go to another screen. Give me a moment. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, one more. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, we have, have them. All right, so I will now pass the floor to the speakers and the moderator for a closing remark, and then we will close our session. And thank you everyone again for attending. So maybe we have a quick um, closing remark in regards to the issues for everyone here. You can start from the moderator and then to all the four speakers. Okay. Um... Let's make it interesting, right? Um, I want to invite all the panelists to give uh, maybe a conclusion about refugees into uh, three verbs, right? So you need to think how to 
calculate that into three verbs about um, how the policy of refugees should become more advanced, right? Um, using the benefit and the luxurious as a moderator. So I will not uh, conclude that because I don't have that expertise. So I want to directly hand it to the speakers. So maybe Dr. Sylvie, um, use your privilege. What are the three verbs that will conclude uh, our discussion? Um, I'll go with um, include, uh, amplify, and Hmm, one more. Does it have to be a verb? <laughs> <laughs> okay, if not the verb, it's fine. Um, share. Share. All right, micro. So, uh, well, using uh, using verbs uh, like this, this creative thing, I think the, as the first verb is to prevent, the second one is to integrate, and the I think the fourth one is to um, update. I think there is a big need to update uh, both the policies concerning protection and policies concerning refugees. So I think update is the, the, the last option. States have to update. Brian. Um, I like Sylvia's. Can I just pick hers? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, will, I will maybe add um, protect and accept. Um, but you know, I had share and include on my list, and those those were <laughs> taken by Sylvia. So I'll uh, I'll have to stop after two. Okay, Dr. Minaj. Okay. Uh, the first one is have them. The second is let them stay, and the third is happiness. I think everyone has a right to be happy. So if the refugees are happy in the, your nation, then let them be happy. Perfect. I believe this is the hardest question that I give it to you. I never not expect it, right? <laughs> my, my simply put, the word is about uh, care, care, and care. I think we need to care more and also uh, to see others as a... Uh, I think um, I inspired by the British doctor who gave up uh, her uh, credits for founding the COVID vaccine. And they give it as a... Uh, to humanity. I think it's a learning curve for the humanity that um, if we talk about humanity, it should be above everything. It should be above politics. It should be above everything. And I think um, political will should be by nature there to support um, our friends who in need. So thank you very much to all the panelists. Thank you for Brian. Thank you for Dr. Minaj. Thank you for Dr. Sylvie. Thank you for Micro for having with us tonight and also thank you for all the audience to watching uh, live and also here and um, thank you for paying attention and investing yourself listening about this important issue so having a good night greeting from jakarta and please stay safe and please wash your hand if you get vaccinated please do not put away your mask this is a very important right so thank you very much bye bye over back to the committee Thank you very much again, all the speakers. Maybe I'll have a quick thank you from Regina as well and Justin, Justin or the participants. Thank you so much, Kevin. Yeah, thank you again, everyone, for being here and have a good night. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, Micro, where? Yeah, thank you, Boo. I think I, I need to, I, I must go back, you know, to Bandung, yeah. So uh, to talk to you again, right? Sometime, right? So yeah. yeah. Sure. Doctor Minaj, everything is okay in India now. Yes. I mean, COVID is it well or how is it? You no, know, we are actually like planning to keep us safe from the third wave. Uh, yeah, happening here as well in Jakarta, right? <laughs> I just curious, Micro, where are you? I am based in Australia, so the reason why outside is is, is dark now. But, uh, oh yeah. I am in Australia. I see. So here is 11 p.m. Although from my accent, I definitely do not sound English uh, native, and the reason is that uh, I'm Italian. Originally I'm Italian, but I've been living in Australia now for about five years. So uh, here is where I'm based, and uh, again, hence the uh, darkness at uh, this time. Where are you in Australia, Miguel? Based in South Australia, so Adelaide. 
Ah. Okay. Oh, in oh, in Adelaide. All right. So you are the Italian who uh, often eat Vegemite now. Ah, yeah, the Italian. Vegemite. Only if you want. So <laughs> here's the thing: the difference between Indonesian we not we do, we don't understand how Australian like Vegemite, but uh, that's a unique uh, story. So thank you very much uh, for having FTCI. I'm very great, Justin. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for uh, all your uh, effort. And also thank you for a B for organizing it. I'll go back to you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, thank, thank you, Justin. Thank you so much. And we'll uh, end the live stream. So thank you for everyone who tuned in. Bye-bye.